Hello, everyone, and welcome to the weekly Wednesday workshop. I'm Felicia Bell from the Gulf States Regional Office located in Jackson, Mississippi. And today we have part two uh, with our Ag Specialist from our Southeast office and it's located in Arkansas. And we have Guy Ames. And so welcome back, Guy. I'm so glad to have you for part two. <laughs> And we had an awesome time last week, and we thank everyone that joined us last week, and we especially thank everyone today for joining us. And we're going to jump right back into our conversation. Um, at this time, Guy, introduce yourself, and then if you can go right into a recap of last week. That was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so my name's Guy. And uh, I've started uh, farming and, and right right into fruit pretty much in, oh, late 70s, 1970s, 1980s. So I've been doing this for a long time, made a lot of mistakes. I've got a master's in horticulture with an emphasis in, in pest control in fruit crops. So we've just barely even touched that uh, last week. Uh, gosh, what did we talk about? We bounced around a lot because we had a lot of good questions. One of yeah. the things we benefits. Yeah. How how does these trees, yeah. nut and fruit trees, benefit our landscape? Right. So uh, first, you know, just the the big picture kind of stuff, which may not always uh, appear to affect your pocketbook. It's good for the environment. It's good not to have to plow. It's good if you've got those uh, trees in the ground. You've got a mulch. You're not having to till. And I think it's well understood now that tillage is killage. <laughs> okay, I'll change it. Tilling is killing. But uh, you really are messing with the uh, soil biota when you till and plow. So having these perennial fruit crops right there is a nice big picture advantage. Uh, now, economically, uh, one of the big advantages is that people want them. You know, it's mm -hmm. fruit. It's a sweet thing. It's a sweet thing that's good. Uh, for you. So to have that, you know, to have something that's good for you and sweet is something that Americans or humans are going to like. Uh, yes. And it's not always easy to bring a crop to market, but still, uh, that's that's going to be the, the big thing there economically is that they're really easy to sell if you can get them, if you can bring them to market successfully. What else? What else did we cover, Felicia? I'm trying to remember. Um, markets. I know we mentioned, you mentioned a few and we may get into yeah. more, but I know you sell as well. So can you share where you sell? Okay. Yeah, that's good. So most of us in the Eastern United States and maybe even a little bit more so in the Southeast are not going to have any easy access to large scale brokers. You know, you think about where most of our fruit and vegetables come from, it's still California or West Coast, apples, you know, of course, it's Washington State, but it's better than 90% of all of our produce comes from the West Coast. Uh, the, the Northeast is a little bit better, but the Southeast, we produce a lot, but it's mostly in our own gardens. So finding those markets, large, medium and large scale markets is a little bit of a challenge for us in the, in the Southeast. And it's, it's not that you're going to be on your own, we can help. Uh, we've got a marketing specialist in the San Antonio office, but I've got some experience too. So where I sell, I've been selling at the Fayetteville Farmers Market, which has some national uh, status, some national recognition uh, as being a, a really good one. And I sell to a local health food store. Uh, I sell to a lot of uh, institutions, some schools. Um, I've sold to... Uh, music festivals, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to be creative, but the main one is going to be uh, farmer's markets, which is still difficult because of the COVID and uh, uh, the supermarkets. For me, it's a health food supermarket because I'm certified nationally grown so I can get uh, some premium on my fruit that way. Mm -hmm. wow. I'd say the next problem, especially now with the, the situation, with the COVID situation, uh, is the online marketing. Yes. And uh, our farmer's market, and I imagine, I'm just guessing, Felicia, you may know if this is going on in Jackson, but our farmer's market now is doing both. You know, we you can sell online through our farmer's market uh, and you can um, come to the farmer's market. Customers can actually come. 
one last thing I want to mention just, you know, with, with uh, computers and social media and stuff is that it really allows you to micro market. You know, I have, uh, I still grow a few apples and I grow some other things that are, that are hard to grow to cosmetic perfection in the South, in the East for that matter, but certainly in the Southeast. So my apples are ugly, oh, but wow. they're pesticide free. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I can find those people that are so determined to find pesticide free apples uh, that they're willing to, to buy the less than perfect fruit from me. So it was really hard to do before. I, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time, but now because of Facebook and other social media outlets, I can find those customers. It often turns out to be uh, mothers of children or parents of children who are trying to find pesticide free produce. Uh, so that's a little summary of, of what I do. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate it so much. And you really have guided us into this week's conversation is more marketing, but then also value added. Like what are the means that you would suggest to fa uh, small farmers, but just farmers in general of us pivoting because we you brought up you know the crisis we in on several uh, uh comments and so what are one the first question is what are some varieties um and i know it's hundreds sometimes thousands of varieties but some of the ones that we may as producers right now be thinking about okay i can add this to my operation and we know we won't get anything off this year but you know we don't know what the future will hold and we need to be thinking about okay another stream of income if we don't have any fruit trees could you share that with us okay you touched on something really important uh, you kind of hinted at it and i'm going to dive into it because this is you know you mentioned that you may not have it this first year after planting and this is quite huge for fruit growers. These are perennial crops. Once you got them planted and once they start bearing, they should hopefully bear yes. something every year. But you have a waiting period with some. It's less than others, you know, with elderberries and blackberries and a few other things, strawberries, you know. It's hard to even think of strawberries as a perennial crop anymore. But blackberries and, and uh, elderberries, you know, you're going to get a crop uh, the year after planting. But with these other ones, you can have a lot invested before you start getting any returns. On the other hand, if you never plant them, then you can never have those returns at all. Yes. So you need to you need to think about this in advance. But maybe one of the things you should consider if you don't have uh, a lot of the infrastructure already up are those things that you can start um, that have some of these benefits, you know, a sweet thing uh, that's easy to market, that's in demand. Uh, it's a perennial, but maybe comes into bearing faster and doesn't have a huge establishment cost. Mm. So let's compare real quickly then uh, without actual uh, figures. We don't need to do that yet. Uh, those figures exist, by the way, but like the establishment cost of a muscadine vineyard. I'm big on muscadines. You can grow them organically, high yields, high marketability, but you're going to have to make a trellis. Mm -hmm. And somebody, if you had to buy all the materials for a trellis, uh, it's going to set you back. Yes. If you're if you're uh, good and young and strong and don't mind cutting your own, <laughs> have the time to cut your own uh, posts. Uh, you've got a, a a line on some wire, which is you know you've got to have that for the trellis too. Uh, you can do it for, and a lot of farmers do this kind of stuff all the time. This is how you make money sometimes is by minimizing the inputs uh but let's compare that to blackberries which you could start with root cuttings you can just yeah you can if you have some plants already uh, uh some nurseries will sell you just root cuttings mucho cheaper than trying to buy full-blown plants mm -hmm. and you can just set those out and uh those root cuttings just in a trench it's it's easier than planting a a bush anyway, cheaper to buy, cheaper to plant, and then you're still going to have fruit the next year. So there's some of these things like that 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 you can really minimize that input. Um, I'm sure that's that's probably prompted some questions in people's minds. Are we ready for any of those yet, Felicia, or do you have some more? 
And I wanted to let, we had several people join us after I made it made the statement. You can put questions in the chat. We want that from you because we want to be able to answer your questions that's pertaining to your farm. And if you are new and beginner farmer, things that you need, we definitely want to answer those questions as well. So please, please put your questions in the chat as well as at the end, I will open up um, and unmute everyone where you can uh, verbalize your question as well. So, all right, we do have one question. What about using six fencing? I, I'm assuming six foot fencing for the trellis. Yeah, so uh, for muscadines, you can make it lower. Uh, if you're doing regular bunch grapes, which is a little bit more problematic in the South uh, because of diseases, uh, you probably want it around five foot. Uh, maybe six. Uh, and if it's not a problem for you, the six foot's fine. And I, I'm assuming you're asking that question because you already have something set up. But one of the advantages of muscadines is that you can you can lower it. You can make it four foot, four and a half foot. You know, you, I see people in these pruning videos and such, you know, you know out of uh, Georgia and North Carolina, where it looks like they've got it about breast high. And that's mm -hmm. nice. That makes it a little bit easier to pick. It makes it easier to prune. So if you have it, if you don't already have it set up, you might want to think about that. But uh, if you've already got something set up, this, you know, if you look at the books, they're going to tell you a way that and make it sound like it has to be done this way. It does not. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works, works. Okay. It's really that simple. And a lot of farmers are going to make that that all important profit by making do. Yes. By making do. You, you look what you got around on the farm and you make do with it. I've got a lot of cedars. I cut those down and split them. And I've, you know, I've got endless amount of, of posts for trellis. So that's a that's good deal for me. That's wonderful. Wow. And then um, we had a, a walk through today because, you know, when you have um, younger children, you know, they don't know, they're learning as they, you know, come up in age, they're learning what's on the land. And it's things that you will pass by every day. And if no one shares with you what it is, you don't think it's important. So we had a, a, a farm walk over today so I could share with my middle son what things are. Um, and so, uh, let's see, the blackberries are coming up uh, on its own, and um, what else? Uh, honeysuckle, that's big there. Elderberry is big. I spoke about that last week. And so, but also share with him, because see, I'm big in natural. And so um, definitely our farm is chemical free, but also utilizing what's on the farm to heal, to take care of us like our elders, like, you know, um, just many, many cultures around the world still do today. And so uh, most of the time I'm telling them, yes, this is here, but then why is it here? Like, what can it do for us to heal us? Nice. <laughs> and so that was, today. So I always will share that uh, with other farmers. Do that, have walkthroughs, have that on your land with your family so they will know because if they don't, they cut it down. And oh, yeah. we have a whole patch, not just a few little blackberries. Like this area is conducive for blackberries and they okay. came in abundantly. And so you don't want that cut down. So please do those walkthroughs with your family to let them know, you know, what's there on the land. And then um, and then being, you know, knowing and being humble for it coming in because you didn't have to plant it nor did you have to buy it so uh <laughs> it's a good thing when they come come in on their own so okay guy we have another question can you provide a picture of a homemade muscadine trellis so this uh, is this yes is, this I can't is what do it here. I, can I don't do. really i didn't make slides or anything but uh yeah. sure we've got my the address is all we've got this somewhere posted right felicia yeah i'm gonna to add contact it. me specifically yeah, but yeah, I'm gonna add it in now so everybody can get your email address. Um, so um, and Guy always says Gaia, but it's I first, it's our first name and then our last name initial. So it's G U Y A as an apple at NCAT.org. Um, 
And right. please, please, yeah, please share that question with God through his email and he can send that to you soon mm -hmm. as he can. <laughs> but I'll All give right. you a clue. I can give you a clue about the fencing. So just regular livestock fencing. Of course, you don't want the barbed wire just because it's going to complicate the uh, uh, the pruning. But basically, uh, muscadines and bunch grapes, they just they need something to climb on but they hardly support themselves until they're really really older and got a huge trunk up until then all that weight's going to be on the trellis so you need to have really good corner um uh construction mm -hmm. and strong enough wire to do it and the wire it's not that big a deal you know the bar barbed wire gauge would be enough you just don't need the barbs on there but uh, i can't remember what the gauge is i want to say nine but doesn't matter. I can provide that for you. So if you're just driving around or on your own place, if you've got cattle, just look at that corner construction. And that's what's going to work for your muscadine trellis. It's not going to be much different. For whatever reason, you'll see a lot of trellis designs, especially for wine grapes, where they have a uh, diagonal uh, brace uh, from a wire from the, from the last post and then a, a diagonal wire. And they have what they call a dead man. It's not a dead man. <laughs> it's a big log or a big rock in the ground. And they've got it tethered to that to provide this diagonal bracing. It's not half as good as just doing regular fencing like for cattle. That's okay. so much better. And you're not going to have something you have to drive around your tractor. Otherwise, you've got this diagonal yes. wire into the ground that, that becomes an impediment to, to movement. Of your farm equipment stuff so just look at the and anybody then in your neighborhood if you don't have the wherewithal you don't have the muscles anymore to do your your fencing yourself you can use those guys those guys mm -hmm. that are that are good at putting up cattle fencing yes same, same thing really not, not any big difference and then also i share with everyone one of uh, our urban farmers they utilize shelving from a grocery store so the grocery store was going out of business so the wire shelving um they have utilized that for trellis for many things not necessarily just muscadines but just lean a uh, lean to leaning them yeah. together uh for our various vegetables to grow up so and the reason for that i'm mentioning is uh your neighborhood you know it's things in our neighborhood businesses going uh out of business sad to say and so utilizing some of those things that they have there but utilizing it for our garden and farm yeah. purpose uh so please mm -hmm. please think outside the box where we're not really getting into spending a lot of money to create uh the infrastructure um yep and also let's yep. see marketing ideas for small amounts of really good stuff um <laughs> i have almonds and hazelnuts and various weird, weird fruits in small amounts throughout the year but not really enough for a consistent farmer market boost so i'm assuming they're they're coming up on their own how could she make it larger make it where it's it's more productive on her land well, this now there's two two questions. There one's to make these things more productive, and the other one is to market what you've got. And mm -hmm. so you've got these things that you just have small amounts of, uh, especially if it's something that people aren't that familiar with, like hazelnuts. Um, I found when I used to go to the farmers market and sell things like jujubes we mentioned last time or pawpaws, um, I'd have this signage up, and I'd have this signage that had all the nutritional advantages of pawpaws and a little bit of the history and stuff people are there to buy food they're not there to get educated <laughs> they might be interested and a few people will be real interested but mm -hmm. most people are there to buy your stuff so maybe have something ready elderberries when i was selling elderberries at the market i had uh, some nutritional facts about elderberries including the medicinal uh qualities and then on the back on the other side i had recipes and then i'd say here it is so mm -hmm. that was a marketing aid, you know, having having these little handouts. Uh, of course, social media allows you to do all kinds of stuff like that. And you can pique a lot of interest uh, in your clientele by posting pictures or a picture, including a picture of a dessert that you made, you know, out of your jujubes, mm -hmm. or, you know, something like that, your candied jujubes or a, a pawpaw bread or anything like that. So 
it, you may have to go a little bit over the top. You wouldn't have to do that with apples. People know they like apples and they're going to buy them. Uh, but with some of these other lesser known stuff, then you may have to do a little education too. But remember that education uh, needs to be um, quick. Give them a handout. Don't mm -hmm. make them stand there. You, you're trying to sell fruit too. You don't want people in line. Yes. <laughs> you yes. want to be taking their money and giving them food. Got you. Hope that and answered then, the question. If they have yes. a follow up. And then she said she planted them so they didn't come up on their own. So she clarified. Uh, Cause yeah, I made the assumption they they come up on their own, mm -hmm. and so thank you for clarifying that for me. Um, now you and and you keep moving towards our marketing, and those are good questions. But I wanted to dive into our cottage food law. We have farmers that some don't even know it exists, um, and so could you share? that for us what is cottage, the cottage food law and then if you can share arkansas's uh way of doing thing and then i can share mississippi yeah you know so i i don't know the particulars of the uh of the arkansas cottage food law but basically what it is it just allows you to can or dry or do whatever at home and uh and you can sell that at a farmer's market then or your your farm stand or whatever because it wasn't that long ago when I first started doing this, that was all prohibited. In yes. fact, when we started the Fayetteville Farmer's Market, I used to give apple samples and all my ugly apples I could sell as long as I could give samples. It came a point because of food safety concerns that I couldn't give samples. Wow. Anytime you opened that fruit or really altered it in almost any way became uh, un under uh, guidelines. It was mm -hmm. legislated, you know, what you could do or not. And uh, so I had to get, I either had to get that cut somewhere else at a certified kitchen or not do it at all. So these cottage food laws, they've come down and everyone's a little bit different. And I wish I'd looked up the particulars of Arkansas, but they're all basically the same. Mm -hmm. It allows you to can at home. And is it, uh, it may be restricted to certain fruits. Do you know, Felicia? Not necessarily certain fruits, but um, no meats, of course, no yeah, no fillers, no no field meat type products. You could do all baked goods and certain things mm -hmm. like that. But uh, no, I haven't. Well, with Mississippi, I haven't seen a list that say you only can do this. It's right. just what the way you put it, what type of product you put it in is those type restrictions. Right. Yeah. The one thing that might be different here, and it's it's uh, it's going to be, I got a feeling it's going on lots of places, but you'd have to be around uh, an institution that was doing it. So we're in Fayetteville, Arkansas, home of University of Arkansas, and we have a, a, a food science department, mm -hmm. and they've got an incubator program there. If you want to make, if you're interested in making a product from your farm produce, they will help you. They will help you. Uh, from harvest all the way to this finished product, including the labeling and things like that. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure where all this might be happening, but uh, I would ask around. And, and of course, if you're from a, a state other than Arkansas and you want to know and you don't know where to start, then just email me again and I'll, I'll do the hunt for you and, and figure out if you have some incubator service like that in your state. But yes. that's been a real boon around here. Is there anything like that in Mississippi? Not as I know of. I know farmers, and, and I have to speak for Central, I don't know of any that's happening in North or South, um, mm -hmm. and we do have people on here from South Mississippi, so they can chime in if, if I'm wrong, if we don't, if we have one in the South. But um, I know as farmers been requesting that and, and wanting to try to create um those type of incubator and commercial kitchen share kitchen yeah. type things yeah. um we don't have one as of yet but uh it's one very close here in jackson though it's, it's very close it's kind of to the point of just inspection that's kind of the last well, you know you're thing. making me you prompted another idea in my mind that i hadn't really thought of before I, i've cooperated in the past with someone else that had a, a certified kitchen which mm -hmm met the requirements of the the uh, uh the santa the sanitation requirements food yes. laws um but i would think that might even be more 
um, possible now. There might be restaurants that are otherwise having problems. They might be happy to share with you, uh, share yes. that space with you. So if they've got a certified kitchen, and every restaurant has to be, yes. it, it might be easier than before. Uh, exactly. Possibly, which is kind of sad because <laughs> they can't yeah. use your kitchen full blown, but it might give you a foot in the door. That way. Exactly. And then uh, income to that restaurant owner. Um, right. So right. it definitely could help because, yeah, most share kitchens um, usually kind of rent them out per hour or That's four hour block. And mm -hmm. so and they're not very, very expensive. They usually are reasonable the ones that I'm familiar with around the country. And so uh, and this information is online where you can find out about shared kitchens. And one of be clear clear though when we talk about commercial kitchens where we uh, that's not associated with the cottage food law so the cottage food law is allowing you to create value-added products and we're on today we're talking about fruit and nuts and so you're able to create value-added products from what you produce, as well as if you purchase fruit and um, nuts and different things from other producers, you can purchase, for us here in Mississippi, you can purchase from other farmers to create products, but you mm -hmm. could do it in your home kitchen, but it is regulations and rules for as your labeling, and recently, because of the prices that we in that we are in, they have opened it up that now we could promote it online because we used to could not do that. And so huh. now you can promote the product online, which is a huge wow. difference <laughs> um, because that's where we are now. We're online. And so I'm so, so glad that Mississippi uh, just tweaked. Uh, that particular rule for us now and I you know it may not be a permanent rule but it's there now and so um, anyone in the state of Mississippi really should be utilizing um, the cottage food law at this time um, just for another uh, stream of income for your farm operation um, and so I definitely I, I and then the commercial kitchen of course is for anyone, like we said, if you want to scale it up and you're able to get into a certified kitchen, that opens up your market even more. So if you're able to, to do those products in a certified kitchen or if you have one and access to one, um, you really can scale your farm business up even greater because now you could create, you're not restricted. You could create other products that, uh, yeah all in the line of your particular kitchen, what your kitchen is able to produce. Um, so I appreciate that guy with, with answering that because yeah, the cottage food law is really able to help uh, farmers again, add another stream of income, but then also push the envelope for themselves to learn how to create products. Um, and it's very valuable. I can say for myself, cause I do, I do um, value added products. Um, we are, we do, we are permitted because we had a cafe. So we are permitted. So we had a certified kitchen. So I, we didn't necessarily do it under the cottage food law, but I promote it because it really, really can help farmers. Um, but if you're able to, to really, uh, create products and you have that on your land, please look into the cottage food law of your state. Um, and again, we're here to help decipher it, but also calling your uh, department, your state department of agriculture for them to explain it uh, fully where you can understand it. Um, so if you have any other questions, please add them in the chat. And then we're gonna move on to other questions. Um, so I know you mentioned on, social media increasing our sales. Um, is there other things that you think we can do? And, and I'm thinking along the lines of like a, a farm stand. What are other things that we possibly can increase our sales? Think about a farmer that may not be internet savvy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was such a long haul for me to get internet savvy now to go back it's hard to even remember exactly. what i did yes um yeah the, 
this is this is a, a common problem with with uh, marketing your fruit crops. Uh, I I don't hardly know a farmers market vendor like myself that doesn't spend at least hasn't spent some time at the farmers market sitting there mm -hmm. not selling anything and wishing you were back home farming. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> of course, you got to sell your stuff. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, if you're sitting somewhere and not selling your stuff, it's really hard. So one of the things I'd like to say in that regard is that uh, you can spend a lot of time, you know, sitting there if you don't have some kind of marketing program. So thinking back how I did it before the Internet, you know, I just took advantage of every little opportunity. I, I wrote my own little press releases, you know, and I, uh, to send to the local paper. Uh, I tried to see if I could get the local TV station to, to come out to the farm, you know, make sure I had something that was photogenic. And I did at those points or I wouldn't have invited them. Yes. Uh, same thing with radio, which, of course, you don't need the photogenic part, but I've had radio out of my place, too. Uh, if there was an opportunity to speak to a, um, uh, a gardening club mm -hmm. or a home ec uh, club, I don't call it home ec anymore, but I don't know what it is, but, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. You just take advantage of every little opportunity that goes by to get your name out there and uh, and your product out there. So, you know, signage can be really important, uh, but this word of mouth is really important, too. Mm -hmm. I, I happen to think that, you know, now I know there's plenty of people that don't have access uh, to the Internet, but uh, it's been such a boon for me to be able to do that, especially with some of the weird products I have. Um, it's really good to be able to market online. But uh, thinking back in the old days, you know, one of the best things uh, that I found for me, one of the um, avenues that was a surprise was the Rural Electric Magazine. Oh, yes. And I'm sure every state has one. Yes. At least all through the, the South anyway, we have these rural electric cooperatives. And those in all these rural areas where a lot of us are living, or you probably wouldn't be on this call, uh, <laughs> it goes to everybody, you know. And and if you can get an article in there about yourself or get a classified ad about what you've got in the back of that little thing, I got more response. You know, this is pre, pre-social pre media, pre-internet uh, mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. I got more response from those, um, from the little classified ads and articles I had in those rural electric magazines than anything else. It's really wow. hard to get advertising in you know, on a newspaper. Hardly anybody reads anymore, a regular yes. newspaper, I mean. Yeah. But uh, everybody gets those in the mail. Yes, yes. So I found those to be really good. There's probably something else like that that I haven't thought of. But, but that's for helpful because um, they still exist. I know I'm. we're part of a, a rural cooperative for our electricity and water. And so they still exist. And so that's a good idea. I hadn't thought in, a, and their magazines are, are really nice magazines. I mean, um, yeah. they, they put a lot into them and um, and they just have always been community oriented um, yes. and stuff. And so uh, great, that's a great suggestion, Guy. I appreciate it. Good, let me say one more thing about the farm stand thing. Uh, I've never done one, but mm -hmm. I worked with Dr. Rome, my, my, my mentor, and he had one. And uh, when he had kids around, his kids would want to do that. And then that was great. But like I've already hinted, you can spend a lot of time just sitting there if you're trying mm -hmm. to actually man this farm stand and uh, you're not on some major thoroughfare or something. It could really try your patience. Uh, he ended up doing the honor system. And yes. He had a lock box on there. He still had a box that was pretty substantial and it was probably welded to a metal post or something. I can't remember. Uh, he probably started off with a coffee can, to tell you the truth. Yes. Uh, you know, but there's probably going to be some teenager that's going to. It's going to decide to get some beer money or something out of that. But uh, uh, that's one way to go, you know, the honor system. But even if you don't want to go complete the honor system, there's ways to have a lock box there and you can have serve your own. and and they work for some people. Uh, and otherwise, you've got to have the right personality. You know, you've got to really want to have people dropping in, you know. And I love my privacy. And if I put myself out there on the road 
you know, people aren't driving into my phone, uh, farm and knocking on the door, you know, that's all right. But if, if you've got that, the personality for doing that, then great. And if you don't, <laughs> you got to get someone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're it's not tough. telling you I not to. I want to be a farmer. I don't have the no patience. I want to get out there and grow the stuff. It's yeah. kind of silly because I have to sell it too, but still. Well, it 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 is the catch twenty two. We you know we we love what we do, but then we also have to sell. Um, but there again, we want to be able to grow the farmers to the point that they can hire someone too, even if it's part time. Um, you know, we want our farmers to scale up and have, you know, making that kind of income that they can hire someone to be able to man a, mm -hmm. a stand, a farm stand, or go to the farmer's market for them. So, you know, we want every farmer to grow uh, financially so uh, you could definitely scale up, but it's so many opportunities. And with that being said, if we're not there yet though, if we're not to a point that you can hire, Think about the intern, you know, opportunities, apprenticeship type opportunities, even during the crisis, one person, you know, one person and, it, you know, you can leave instructions in a shed or something like that. And that person can do that work for you. Um, and so it's, it's still things that we can do at this time that can assist us and even, you know, not having to pay money out. If it's an intern or a volunteer type uh, program that you would like to start on your farm and have people sign up per hour where they're not together. Yeah. Um, one person per hour uh, sort of things like that. So wanting, you know, you all to think outside of the box when it comes to the needed uh, assistance on our farm. Um, and like Guy said, we always don't have the time to sit there, but we do need to sell. So just want you to, to you know, think about those things. All right. One, other, one other quick oh, idea, and that's, the, yes. and that's the open house or field day. Oh, yes. Uh, or a uh, festival yes. so we're we haven't had to do it yet but we're going to have enough pawpaws eh, it should have been this year but covid's going to keep us from doing it mm -hmm. but we're going to have enough pawpaws that we're going to have a festival coming up soon so we'll wow there'll be a time where we have a weekend a whole weekend and uh you know we'll probably have a live band and and uh and sell pawpaws hand over fist i hope because we can do that at the farmer's market too but that's kind of a compromise between having to sit out there at the farmers, I mean, at the a stand every day and still let people know you've got them. You can say, hey, come out to my place this weekend and then in the future, order online. Yes. <laughs> or, yes. or call me and we'll bring them to a drop off spot or something like that. I don't exactly. quite have the personality for dealing with people every day at the farm <laughs> stand. <laughs> I got you. Definitely. I definitely understand that. And and then um, during, you know, this time, I have noticed virtual farm tours. Oh, yeah. Have you seen those guys? No, but I, I had a virtual C. Uh, I'm certified nationally grown. Mm -hmm. And we farmers in that program uh, peer inspect. We inspect one another. Yes. And so we had a, a virtual inspection tour which was actually a little awkward, but <laughs> we got it done. Yes, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, if you're trying to, if you had it planned, I think you could do a really good job of that. Yeah, because we, again, we have to think about how to pivot and virtual farm tours that's that you're branding yourself you're you're saying hey we're open for business and so that's a way that you can utilize uh you know your cell phone your cameras to be able to do that virtual farm tour on your facebook page or your business facebook page but it'll get you out there and then at that time promote whatever product you have um, doing that farm tour. So it's just many means that could be done at this time. Yeah. Now, I wanted to share uh, two opportunities and thank you so much, Minda, for sharing this with us. Square Online Store has been used very well with small farm and farm stands in North Carolina and really around the country. I utilize Square and in, 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 in our um, stores there as well. So Square is very, very good to get started. 
um, and very easy to, to utilize and work as well. The next one that she shared is many growers have benefited from North Carolina Cooperative Extension's Debbie, hopefully I'm saying this right, Ruth or Rouse training on how to make the best from online sales. And she has put the link to both of these opportunities in the chat. So thank you so much. Now, one of the questions we have, what fruit trees would you recommend for central Mississippi? And that's really kind of the South as well. Yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, the, the everybody automatically thinks apples. So no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna recommend them. Certainly if we're talking about a crop that you're gonna be able to sell. It's just okay. going to be a struggle. It's a struggle to even grow them. You know, it's a struggle to make to get them to make fruit in the in in the deep south. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's going to be even harder uh, to sell them because they're probably going to be ugly. Um, so probably not uh, apples. Peaches uh, could be great. Uh, the problem with peaches is. Um, well, a lot of problems. You're going to have to spray them if you're going to be commercial. You're just going to have to. And there's really, at this point, even though there's in my peach publication available through the Atra site, uh, I've got a hypothetical organic peach spray program. Uh, if you had a year like we've had these last three years here in Arkansas where it's wet all through the spring and the early summer, it is really hard not to get overtaken with the brown rot and bacterial canker a lot of the other diseases of fruit so peaches have a lot of potential uh but you're, you're just going to have to spray so it's probably not going to be organic um i won't mention you said trees specifically so i'll stick with that i'm really big with pawpaws i you mm -hmm. know it's a it's a specialty crop but the people that love them love them and so far now I've got this college town here and you maybe think uh, because of that, I've got more open minds. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, for whatever reason, when I bring those pawpaws uh, up there in my pickup truck, I can just sell them as fast as I can bag them up. You know, yes. same thing. I last year I sold pawpaws to schools, to the Missouri, Arkansas railroad, to a, uh, a music festival, um, just all over. I just could hardly keep up with it. So, even though you may not know what a pawpaw is and half the people you know may not know that there's people out there that do and they want them and they're <laughs> native and yes. they're, it's not that they don't have any problems but boy compared to apples let's say or peaches boy it's they're easy okay so I, I, another question was fruit trees but i do want to mention um well of course there's figs it's always figs and everybody else they may you may be saturated with figs there already in central mississippi i don't know but you know, you can certainly grow figs here. Uh, but rabbit eye blueberries and the uh, the uh, oh gosh, it's a rabbit eye high bush blue, uh, blueberry cross. I can't think of what they're called right now. But anyway, the blueberries have gotten real big. They're actually just right behind peaches now in Georgia uh, is the biggest fruit crop. So that's something you have to have irrigation. Your establishment costs are still going to be high, but blueberries. I'm still big on muscadines. They're not a tree, but Muscadines are really easy to grow, really easy to sell. Yes, thank you so yeah. much. And sure. if you have any other questions or want some of these expounded upon, please, please contact uh, Guy through email at guya at ncat.org. And um, also, Guy, we have a question um, about the kale and clay. Uh, yes. for repelling insect, and you spoke on that last week. Can you share right. with, with these uh, participants as well about the kale and uh, clay? Okay, just in general, you think? Yes, because the question okay. is, what do you think of it for as repelling insect damage on peaches? Okay. And I know you spoke on that last week. Right, right. So peaches present a, a particular problem with the kale and clay because of their fuzziness. So they're going to retain this clay and uh it's going to make it a little bit harder to market it because it's going to it's going to look like a residue and actually it's going to look like a pesticide residue when it isn't really it's just mm -hmm. it's just a clay and it's the same clay that we use in toothpaste and, and the ko pectate that's mm -hmm. why it's called ko pectate because it's made from kaolin clay <laughs> um 
So it works against the major peach insects, you know, stink bugs and plum curculio, um, but, uh, and it's a repellent in case you don't know this, but uh, the problem is, is that it washes off and um, it's not cheap. It's a bulky material, it's heavy. Uh, maybe you could get it cheaper in parts of the South. It's mostly mined in, in big pits in Georgia. So maybe if you were close to Georgia, maybe you could get it. But it's not just any clay either, by the way. It's got to be ground to a certain uh, uh, grind. It has to be a certain size particle. So you need to buy the, you really, you could have a disaster if you sprayed the wrong <laughs> oh, wow. grind. Uh, you could actually impede photosynthesis and basically smother your trees. But you buy this product, the kale and clay product, it's called Surround just like you surround something. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what you want to buy. Anyway, uh, because probably because it's so bulky, it's heavy, it's expensive. And so if you put it on, and if you had a year like these last couple of years, uh, you could put it on multiple times and just have it wash off with the rain. Um, we've actually got an economic analysis of that in our Apple publication, Atra's Apple publication. There's an economic analysis of, of uh, kale and clay. And it's, it's possible, but you get a year like last year and you'd lose money if you were a commercial grower and trying to do any of that. So it's, I highly recommend it for home growers. I think if you're going to go uh, commercial organic, it would have to be in your arsenal. It would have to be there and you just have to hope we don't get these rainy years. Um, in my peach publication, I talk about using the kale and clay. And I talk about when you want to stop using it so you don't have that residue. It'll just weather off. You know, I said rain off, but, you know, it just kind of fades away anyway. So if you stop, I'm trying to remember when that peach is about, you know, golf ball size instead of, you know, the full size peach. It's going to weather off okay and it's mm -hmm. going to look all right. But um, it'll work. It's good. It's good stuff. It works against all these peach insects. Just keeping a film on with the rain that we've had you know in the, you can expect some we're a temperate zone jungle in the south mm -hmm. <laughs> when i mention that to people they go oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we have winters but boy oh boy this yes. time of year you it's a reminder it's really a jungle out there with a lot of rain so yeah. expect that it's, a lot of it's going to wash off so it's a uh, it's a good one if you're organic you're going to have to have it uh, it's going to have to be in your arsenal, but just know that there could be problems. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, one question I have is, what is be the best like acreage size? So think of more so new beginning farmer, because um, definitely the ones of us already, you know, have land implanted, you know, somewhere we can't change it. But a new and beginning farmer haven't, you know, bought any land. What is that you would suggest the best acreage size to be profitable, though? Okay. Yeah. So this varies a lot, too. And uh, you have to remember that, like it or not, you're competing with whatever's in the grocery store. You, know, you may have those people that are really committed to local organic foods or local foods, and uh, they're willing to pay a premium for that. But still, everybody has an idea in their head what an apple is supposed to cost, you know, per pound or whatever. They go to Walmart like we all do, and they kind of know. So I, I say all that as preface uh, to some ugly facts that with apples, for instance, when they look at the economics of this, the break even, what they call the break even acreage, you know, that you look at all the costs of putting it mm -hmm. together and what you can expect to get after four or five years, uh, it's bad. It's like five oh. to 15 acres, depending on where you are, you know, so nobody's going to put in 15 acres just fresh, especially not in the South. Now, this changes a lot uh, depending on the crop and how you can establishment. Those establishment costs vary a lot. So if you're talking about blackberries, for instance, and, and you want to start from root cuttings, which I don't see any reason not to, uh, I've done it myself. It's really easy and just a lot cheaper, a okay. lot, lot cheaper. You can take those establishment costs uh, to almost nothing if you have the land. You still got to do some watering and things like that, but you can get a, a, a nice little profit off of a half an acre or an acre. If you've already... If you're already selling something, if you've already got a, a vegetable uh, mm -hmm. operation going and you want to add blackberries to it, 
you're immediately going to, or not immediately, but the second year, you're going to start making some money off of those things. And uh, they're just really easy. Uh, peaches are going to be somewhere in between blackberries and apples. That you're, but you're still going to have, now peaches, you can sell the heck out of them if you can get them to market. Uh, but you're still going to uh, have to have like two or three acres, you know, to, to what they call the break-even acreage, you know, where you're making up for what you put into it because you're still going to have to have irrigation. And, uh, another thing with peaches and some of these tree crops, you're going to have to have a spray rig because mm. uh, there's some pruning systems where you can keep it short, but almost in, inevitably you're going to have to have a spray rig with blackberries and rabbit eye blueberries and muscadines. If you ever do have to spray them, which it won't be often, you can do it with a backpack sprayer. Okay. You, know, you know, it's a 120 bucks or something. It's not a big deal. But if you want to get a sprayer that's going to reach to the top of that peach tree or, or uh, Lord help us, a pecan tree, you're going to spend some money. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you got to think about that. Uh, what else is cheap? Pawpaws are pretty cheap to get into, although you're going to have to wait three to four years before you start getting a crop. Elderberry is really easy to get into. Again, you can almost propagate your own. If you knew somebody had some decent elderberries, you can just take cuttings. You can do hardwood cuttings and just put them in your garden and get going on them. Yeah. So, you know, if you're talking about trying to make a living and you want to have a single crop, uh, those acreages are going to be high. But if you're yes. trying to augment an operation you already have or to be a companion uh, crop for these other things, then I wouldn't worry too much about the acreage. Uh, one of those that you might think about really getting into that with minimum input, uh, again, would be the thornless blackberries. You can really get into it pretty fast. You might get lucky and not even have to irrigate them except for, you know, during really um, emergency periods. Mm -hmm. uh, rabbit eye blueberries, which are real popular now, big sellers going big in the south. Uh, like I said, they're the second biggest fruit crop in, in Georgia now, and I, I think it's almost that big in the Carolinas. Uh, you have to have irrigation. You have to, which is a big upfront cost. And by the way, just to make you understand the, um, the way the economics of these things work, if you're going to have an irrigation system for an acre, uh, and hope to pay it off with that acre, it's going to be difficult. That's why they have break-even acreages because the cost of these things like an irrigation system or a trellis or, you know, ladders that you might need for trees and all those other stuff. Mm -hmm. You spread that out over a bunch of acres and then it's less per acre. Yes. You know, that's why they have a break-even acreage. So, you know, to put in a, a, an acre of, of blueberries and you have to have an irrigation system, uh, maybe you've got a cheap municipal supply or something like that, but it it can it can end up costing. So elderberries, uh, blackberries, you can get a quick return, very little upfront costs. Uh, but some of these other things, uh, it's gonna it's either gonna take longer, like pawpaws. You don't have a lot of costs. I mean, you're gonna have to mow and do some weed control, uh, but it's gonna take three or four years before they start bearing a crop too. Okay. I hope that answered the question. That was a lot yeah. of no 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 meandering on my part. But. No, okay. no, no. It, it answered the question because we need to know the ups and downs. We need to know where you're not going into these operations blindly. Now, we're we're talking a lot about fruit and, and that's good. But then what about, and, and one of our guests mentioned it, nut trees. Could you share what nut trees that may be beneficial as well? Okay. So we talked a little bit about pecans last time and I just mentioned them again. And and pecans, again, are, are, are pretty easy to sell. Now, the last few years, they've, uh, the price have went up because of uh, the Chinese market. But that's been goofed up because of all the uh, trade wars with China and stuff. But for a while, it looked really good. And there were people in Arkansas that were converting rice acreage over to pecans. But wow. anyway, uh, you do have to have, uh, depending on where you're at, you're going to have to have a big sprayer because of the pecan weevil. And if you're in the middle of the woods, it could be pretty tough. Felicia said it wasn't too bad for you with pecans. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Oh. It's, uh, you know, here in Arkansas, if, if you're anywhere near the woods where there's hickories, it's hard to find a, a, a nut, a shell with a kernel in it, oh, <laughs> with wow. any meat in it. It's okay. really, it's bad. And you, you couldn't market them because you wouldn't know. I mean, they'll float off if you wanted to do that. You, there's a way to float off the damaged nuts, but oh, still, wow. it's a, it's tricky. 
Mm -hmm. Almonds, uh, hopefully everybody knows you can't do those. Mostly they just bloom too early, way early. Okay. And, uh, it'd be really difficult. Hazelnuts are native to much of the eastern United States and, and certainly the upper south. They're, they're native here in the Ozarks. You don't see them. I've got a few in my place. Uh, the hazels, you know, are the first cousin to the filberts. The filberts mm -hmm. are a nice large nut. Uh, there it is. <laughs> I'm trying to think about this camera, what it looks like. The hazelnut, uh, the, the filbert's a pretty large nut. The hazelnut, the American cousin, is quite a bit smaller. Uh, I think there's going to end up being a, a wholesale market for it. Uh, I eat mine, uh, you know, for desserts and little specialty things. I think you could probably sell small amounts of them, but that's going to be tough. Let's see what else. Black walnuts. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, a... Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. It's a, a commercial crop so much as just a homestead crop. That's how I see it at this point. Mm -hmm. you, you could always fatten up hogs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was going to ask, are they uh, picked or the hazelnut? Because you're saying, I think, hazelnut can, can be grown in the South. Now, is it a, a pest that come with that? Okay, okay. So the hazelnut uh, is actually... If you get the real hazelnuts, not the filberts, there's a thing called the Eastern mm -hmm. Filbert blight that'll pretty much wipe out real filberts. The, there's, a, um, there's a breeding program going on in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and uh, they're hybridizing filberts with hazelnuts. There's two species of hazelnuts. Uh, they're trying to develop a full-blown commercial crop for protein. It's going to be mechanically harvested, like with blueberry harvesters. I don't know if you've ever seen a blueberry harvester, any of mm -hmm. you have. No. Uh, but it will be, this is something that'll be for small scale commercial growers up to, you know, really large scale acreages. Um, for those of us, most of us are small scale. That's still going to be, I, I think you can still market some. Uh, and by the way, in order to get that full hazelnut flavor, like they have a hazelnut flavoring uh, coffees and things like that, mm -hmm. you've got to uh, uh, dry it. You've got to kind of uh, cure it, you know, yes. cure it for a while. Uh, it won't develop those strong flavors until it's uh, been uh, in storage for a little while. Uh, okay. But I, I don't quite see that one being much of a commercial crop either. Okay. Uh, not for us. It's not for most small scale growers, except for just mm -hmm. little specialty things. Okay, here's one that does have some potential, I think, for the South, uh, and that's chestnuts, Chinese chestnuts. Mm, okay. The American chestnut, you know, which was... Um, I, I would love to have seen the South when the American chestnut was still around. Most, I'm sure that all our listeners know that uh, that it's no, it's not here anymore. It's gone because of the chestnut blight. But Chinese chestnuts are pretty easy to grow. They're completely free of the chestnut blight. Uh, markets are, you'd have to develop a local market, uh, and you might have to educate uh, your clientele about it. But they're pretty easy to grow, and. Uh, and that'd be an easy one to feed your hogs too if you couldn't sell them. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, but they uh, produce like crazy. Use. They produce well too. They, they you okay. can get some big crops off of Chinese chestnuts. Wow, that's There's amazing. There's a guy in Florida doing it commercially, uh, mm. kind of large scale. So uh, I know it can be done in South. If you can do it in Florida, you can do it just about anywhere, I'd say. Yes, okay. When in, um, we had a comment, black walnuts are native to Northwest Arkansas. Will English walnuts grow here meaning northwest arkansas yeah not really uh mm -hmm. i've got a tree on my place and uh <laughs> yeah they they just bloom too early you know that it's not a blooming well it's an inflorescence you might as well call it bloom yeah mm -hmm. i don't expect to get a crop <laughs> oh wow okay. they're fun it's a beautiful tree <laughs> yes yes i wish yeah Got you. Well, we're coming to the end, guys. This oh, hour always go by so fast. <laughs> I'm just getting started. I know. It goes by fast when we get uh, in our conversation. And what I'm going to do briefly um, for everyone is open up um, where you can actually speak if you would like to ask any questions, um, you could do that. It is time these last few minutes. Um, you definitely are welcome to leave at this time because we are at our time, but please, if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat. Um, we can, we, you know, we're here to answer them for a few more minutes, as well as remember to email guy at G-U-Y-A 
at NCAT.org, as well as um, check us out with all of our information for us, our publications, webinars, podcasts, our videos at ATRA, A-T-T-R-A dot NCAT.org. And that's where you can find all of this information plus much, much more. So at this time, please, if you would like to speak, you could do that as well as drop things in the chat. Thank you all. We appreciate um, Guy, we got several people saying thank you. They appreciate you and just sharing your experience. So we we appreciate that so much. And we uh, definitely welcome everyone back next week. We will have another guest, another specialist from uh, the NCAT offices. And we just welcome you uh, to that meeting as well. And we thank you today for joining us. So I think that's it, guys. We don't have any other questions. Um, and definitely, I know you will get some feedback in your email. So uh, I definitely appreciate you joining us today. Thanks, Felicia. It's been fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.